I am, yes, I won't take any notes of you at all. I am now recording. I'm not in the least shy. I am now, I'm extremely tired. I am now recording for the third time because I think the story is of interest. My interview with Mr. Winston Churchill in September 1938. This interview arose in the following manner. I was at the time working in the BBC and um, I had met Mr. Churchill before dining with Venetia Montague and he had been most friendly. I was extremely upset by the events of Munich Week and in fact ultimately resigned from the BBC in order to try and join up as a result of them and as a result of this conversation which you are now going to hear. Anyhow, I rang Mr. Churchill up and said, could I come down? He said, yes, by all means. And I had a Ford V8, which I was very fond of at the time, and I drove down to Westrum to see Mr. Churchill and arrived, I think, at about 11 o'clock in the morning. The door was opened by the butler and I saw Mr. Churchill sitting in his study by himself immediately afterwards. And I said to Mr. Churchill, it is very kind of you to see me. I simply do not know what I ought to do and before doing anything I would like to have your views. Though, of course, they are known fairly generally. Personally, I said, I am in some despair. And Mr. Churchill said, um, first thing, and my best answer will be to show you and allow you to read a letter. It's in English. And I have it in my pocket. It's from Herr Beans. From Herr Beans. And out of the left-hand breast pocket of the boiler suit that he was wearing, it was before the days of the siren suit, he produced a letter from Prague signed by Edward Benish, which ran, in my recollection, roughly speaking, as follows. My dear Mr. Churchill, we have met, though perhaps you do not remember. I am writing to you to ask you for your advice and for your assistance. What can I do and can you help me about my unhappy country. And Mr. I read that letter, and Mr. Churchill looked at me and said, um, You see, Herr Beans has written to me. He's asked for my advice and for my assistance, for my help. But what advice shall I return? What assistance can I offer? Here am I, said Mr. Churchill, thumping himself on the blue boiler suit that he was wearing. Here am I, said Mr. Churchill, an old man without power and without party. What help shall I give? What assistance can I offer? What answer can I return? Because answer I shall and must. But what shall I proffer? 
And I uh, thought, said the right thing at that moment and said, um, Oh, Mr. Churchill, don't be so downhearted. Um, offer him your eloquence. Stump the country, I said. Make speeches. Awaken people, I said. Addressing him as though he was me. Awaken people, I said, to the issues at stake, I said. And um, he was rather pleased by that, I think, because he, he, he warmed and said, Ah, oh, yes, yes, my eloquence, that indeed, her beans can count on, in full and okay. Mr. Burgess, what other help have I to offer? What else is there? What can I give? And I didn't say anything at this point because I shot my diplomatic bolt by my fortunate recollection of the word eloquence a moment before and had nothing to say at all and therefore did not say anything. And Mr. Churchill was struck by this and said, uh, ah, ah, you were silent, Mr. Burgess. You are rightly silent. What else? What else? What else am I to offer? One thing, he said, one thing. And I didn't say what's that. It wasn't necessary. One, he said, my son. Randolph, he said. Randolph, who is already, I trust, a gentleman, is training to be an officer. So there was nothing necessary to be said after that. And as far as I can remember, the third time telling the story, this is the moment at which the conversation about Munich stopped. We had, what have I left out? We had a bit of mutual hatred about Chamberlain and about Simon, and I now put on record something that I've forgotten in the two previous versions, which is that uh, Harold Nicholson and I used to go to the same club, clubs rather, Harold's Club, the Travelers, and my club, the Reform, and follows John Simon, Lord Simon nowadays, about. And we used to sit next to him in the halls of our clubs. And we used to say to each other, without mentioning his name, a man, we used to say, at least I used to say in Churchill's voice, a man of the most infinite cowardice. And he always used to look around. Anyhow, um, having finished discussing Munich with Mr. Churchill, I left his house and got into my car outside, and I have forgotten to mention that before doing that, he had trotted out of the room and said, I'll leave you, but I return. And he did return in about a minute and a half, bearing volume. And he said, Mr. Badgers, he said, before you leave me, I would wish that you would accept this, my speeches. In these speeches, I say, at some length, what you and I know, but what His Majesty's government has not yet grappled with, that there is a war coming. And I, I warn the country in this volume, edited by my son Randolph. And I would like to write in this book for you. And he wrote in the book, uh, and I still have it, and it's in Alan McLean's flat at 123 East 53rd Street at the moment. He wrote in the book to Guy Burgess from Winston Churchill to confirm his admirable sentiments, Munich, September 1938. 
and Anthony Eden refused to spoil the book by signing it subsequently, actually. Anyhow, I trotted out to the car, and as I got into the car, Mr. Churchill trotted out and patted the car and said to me, and he said, this war, which you and I know is coming,